perfect. Thank you. If you really want enlightenment, then just lighten up. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to into another edition of Paradigm Shift and educational comedy. And this one I'm titling as The Death of Evil. First, I'm going to play a short, yeah, roughly 20 minute or so audio clip from a radio show called Open Your Mind, where a few months ago there was a guest by the name of Michael um, Sarian, I think you pronounce his name as, T-S-A-R-I-O-N, Michael Sarian, um, November 23rd, 2014. And he's talking in this clip about exactly how and why the globalist power structure is like at each other's throats and why this can be a really good thing for us you know for those of us who are willing to be empowered and how we can totally take advantage of their confusion and you know make things better so I'm just going to play this clip and um, then, you know, I'm going to get your thoughts on it, and we're going to, you know, just kind of discuss this. So let me know when you're ready and when you're, you're, okay. you're done navigating your house. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am ready right now. Okay, are you sure? I'm about to sit down. Yes, I'm sure. All righty. Here we go, then. The head of the snake has been really cut off, and they're struggling, and they're battling, and they're fighting. There's infighting going on, and they're fighting each other, and maybe they are all trying to grab the treasure now that the the pirate captain is dead. And we've just seen so much going on, and there's also probably an element as well. I don't know whether you agree with this that even the people that on the top of they're gone, the minions will have to be showing some kind of control to the outside world, otherwise it will just escalate to the speed of the collapse of the, the, the cabal. That's right. There's a tremendous danger of that. And I think that that's one of the reasons, if, uh, if we go through a few reasons, what you just said there is very true, that it's not that this uh, death uh, was planned. You see, this is the whole point. The, the original masterminds, were expecting that their descendants would be competent. They're, you know, you can't live forever, so no matter who you are, you need, you know, just l let us think of somebody like Cecil Rhodes or Lord Alfred Milner or, you know, Lord Sykes or, or any of the endless amount of names that we could mention who, who played a role at the higher ranks. And then, as I mentioned, the names of the Afondi, you know, these are the extremely wealthy College of Cardinals and people like them and the orders to which they belong, Masonic orders to which they belong. These people expect that when they die, or as they age, they will have lieutenants who will take over, and like, like, a lot, like a lot of organizations do. But in reality, you see, this often doesn't work. You cannot count, and I mean you cannot count, the amount of profligate sons and daughters who have spent thriftly and flagrantly uh, wasted the resources of their fathers. Just, I'm not talking about in business now, I'm not, just in, I'm not talking about conspiracy, I'm just talking about regular business, you know, somebody who slaved to open companies back in the 20s or in a previous century even, and they build and they build and they build these empires, and then some ludicrous uh, playboy son or daughter just goes and throws it all away, you know, at, at the gambling tables or spend just, uh, you know, yachting around the world yeah. and spending it all, uh, frivolously. This, this has happened even in business, let alone on higher levels. So one of the reasons why there could be a major a major declination in the major conspiracy is simply because the uh, steering committee level personnel die off and their descendants prove relatively incompetent. This is the key, you see. And then they're all grabbing the chart and they're all trying to grab the wheel of the ocean liner to say, you know, I know where I'm going, get out of my way. It's like some Alice in Wonder, Wonderland kitchen or some trolls around a cauldron saying, give me the pepper, give me the salt, you know, I know how much you'd be going into it, get out of my way. And in the end, the dish is a catastrophe. They haven't read the recipe book properly. They may even have lost sight of the North Star. You know, to take our metaphor of the liner, they may have the charts. They may not be able to make sense of the charts because the vision that their forefathers had, they were obsessed with. These were a different caliber of psychopath. Uh, and the later psychopath is just 
He's equally psychopathic, make no mistake about it, that the descendants are no less evil than the original group. But the simple fact is, they may not have the same ideology. It may just be very vague to them. What are we doing all of this for? Do I really want to occupy these seats of power? You know, I prefer just to play boy around. I don't, I prefer just to grab all this money and, and have these, and, and have these escapades. You know, I don't seem to have the same metal. Is, is, a, is the word I'm looking for, the, the, the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, -E, you know, riding in the battle like these, you know, stiff up our lip previous incarnation guys yeah. who were utterly, 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 utterly dedicated in a way that the modern man, therefore, their descendants have no clue. So when you're dealing with Opus die and you're dealing with the Propaganda Due or you're dealing with, you know, uh, the Jesuit order and the Alpha Lords of Freemasonry, this sort of Lord Kitch Kitchener gung-ho ride in the battle, you know, uh, philosophy, this sort of crazy psychopathy, is really no longer found in the lily-livered, spendthrift, imbecilic descendants, uh, you know, that you have later on. And they're, they're just not able to decipher the charts anymore. The guiding star has become occluded, and they just go round and round and round in circles. The uh, conspiracy is technically still going, but it's going on autopilot, you know, so to speak. Yeah. And they just uh, and another another thing that can happen is uh, because I've written about John D and I've written about some of the heavy hitting architects of control, you know, pointing out to my readers just how serious this conspiracy is and how deadly it is. But the thing is, you see that these people had goals in mind, goals for the 20th century, goals for the 21st century and beyond. You know, and in my Atlantis book, I name what those goals are. One of the most important ones is literally vacating this planet, you know, with, with the use of their technology. But putting that aside. Let's just generally accept that these people have definite goals. But see, as time passes, time has its own strange energy. And as you are tunnel visioned, as you're, you, you know, when you're tunnel visioned on these agendas, you're also blinkered to what life itself is doing. You don't know what's going to happen in history. You don't know what time will do. You don't know what the thinking patterns of the next generation is going to be, let alone of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations down from where you have existed. So there's a lot of variables that these hierarchs, these evil arcs, simply cannot predict. And these things, these variables can often work in uh, against them, against their agenda. Just like I say, you have a goal, you work to facilitate that goal, and for some damn reason, you know, and this can happen to a snooker player, this can happen to a, you know, a track runner, this can happen to a person who's trying to, you know, invent the greatest uh, sports car, and all sorts of weird variables come up that basically block you, you know. And then another thing is, it, it ties it ties with what I've just said, is that simply, even if you do reach some of the outcomes. They may not be satisfactory because when you plan something, you don't actually really know how the outcome is going to come out. So generations go by, right? Centuries go by, and then some of these things may have even been realized. The cons I think some of the things that the conspiracy wanted have been realized, especially in terms of technology. Mm. But you see, centuries have gone by, and and the outcomes that you may have predicted just don't quite come to pass as you'd hoped. And therefore, now there has to be some sort of uh, uh, replay or some sort of you know reconfiguration of the plan. This also, I think, is is, is important, but. Never, never forget that simply the process of history itself, the process of time, these people think they're in control of it. But of course, that's laughable. Any fool, I mean, it's almost a, di it's almost a symptom of psychopathy to believe that you can have so much power that you can organize and control the flow of time. The actual existential fact is you can't. Even if you've got all the money in the world and you've got all these lieutenants, you still cannot uh, reign. You cannot uh, reign in time and make it go your way. You see, so there's that to, to bear in mind as well. Um. No, totally great. And did, did, there is the other side of the coin which I'd like to throw in here as a topic of discussion. Do you feel that maybe what's going on as well is part of their plan to show that they're weak and, you know, they're shown they're kind of on the belly, but they're doing it on purpose to um, fool people into thinking that they are weak? Yes, of course, this is key. Because, and now that what you said will even be more important to them because now that the head boy has blown his brains out or died of some hideous disease and it's just the palpitations of this monster, you know, if you kick it and it shudders, they, they, they can't believe it. You've got to realize that this change in the status quo has completely thrown a spanner into the higher echelon. These people are looking for a leader and they're not finding one. And they're noticing that it's like, you know, Al Capone has been, uh, you know, taken out of the scene and all the other lieutenants are just trigger-happy people. And that is why they had this debacle in the Vatican back at the death of Pope Paul I, which shows me a serious meltdown. That shows me a serious lack of control, where all these bankers and underbankers are just grabbing and grabbing money for themselves and running amok and making all sorts of deals. And if you think about it, since that period, there has been sort of some weird, uh, you know, 
It's all been a free-for-all, like these Bushes and private private families like the Bushes, well, even like Lyndon Johnson before him, before them, you know. And there's almost been a grab, and it's been putting these people that will be good people's champions, like Clinton, but they haven't a baldy. They haven't a clue about actual politics or anything else, and they have to have a bevy of these uh, Brzezinski types to, you know, uh, steer the ship of state. Even they don't do it that well. So the statesmanship is, is gone. Uh, and all you have now is a bunch of lower level, uh, incompetence running the ship. Then that needs, that, that percolates down into the local state level, right? Causing all sorts of chaos and all sorts of, that's why you cannot even count the amount of, uh, discrepancies and scandals in, in the, in, in terms of mayors and city and state politicians. And the whole thing is just coming apart. Not, not to, let, not to mention just other forms of incompetence that I'm sure listeners are completely familiar with. And things that they're seeing on a daily daily basis, idiotic things. All of these idiotic things, not to mention the uh, financial meltdowns, these re- weird wars, the rising of the Islamic fundamentals, things that should have been handled, uh, you know, uh, easily, are now running rampant, oozing out of the woodwork, and a lot of other uh, financial meltdowns and what have have you. All of this is symptomatic. You see, now as I say in the beginning, it could be wrong, but I feel that I'm right that uh, this tussle, this tug of war, and of course to hide that. They'll do what you're talking about, which is to distract. And that's easy. They're, they've got experts who are really, really good at distracting you, uh, you know, uh, uh, into other uh, headlines, other things that are happening, uh, to disguise the fact. Now, the point that I was really hoping to make was that while this head, the head has been cut off and it is dead, and the thrashing around can also be, you know, negative in its own way, because now what might happen is we're in danger of having another. Uh, conspiracy type thing take over you know uh, there's a situation in which one the main one has died but there could incarnate another sort of control some other kind of draconian control mm. and also on a more deeper psychological note and this is more like focusing on my particular work and that is even though the main uh, prison warden is dead and even though the prisoners can actually technically walk out of the prison there's a psychological, you know, compulsion in people to not want to be free. So I do agree on the optimistic side that we are, we have, uh, and I've already said that we, you know, since 9/11, we've had so many uh, thinkers and teachers and writers. This is this is unique to our history. So there's every chance that now there is this uh, phase shift in the uh, status quo, and people have a chance to be more free mentally and spiritually and even physically than they've ever had a chance in history before. But of course. The intelligent man knows that uh, not everybody wants to sign off from the contract because these things are two-way contracts. It's, it's not just boot to the head, uh, gun to the head. You know, the, the hierarchy may be weaker, and the bonds that we had with them, the agreements we had, you know, may be slightly moldy. You know, the chains may be moldy enough for you to pull them off. But the other thing that we might see is that people don't want to pull them off. They just want to replace those chains of iron with chains of gold. And so now the responsibility falls deeply onto the individual you know, uh, uh, person, you, me, the listeners here now, you know, to pick up the slack and say, yeah, you know something, I'm glad to know that there's been this uh, kerfuffle on the top levels of the pyramid. It may not be as draconian, it may not be as strong as it was before, but it still falls to me to do something about that. Uh, and then finding out, how do I heal? How do I, uh, pur- you know, how do I purge from my system all that slavery yeah. that, I, you know, my forefathers have been in? And what can I do it with my consciousness to feel free, to get rid of these uh, these uh, attributes, these symptoms of slavery? And I've always advocated in my work that that means a deeply radical new relationship with what you have been called your negative emotions, uh, like anger, like anxiety, violence, guilt, shame, hate. Because if you don't, then you remain enslaved in another way, and you'll still be running to those, you know, artif- those pharmaceutical drugs or the illicit drugs, you know, you'll still be enslaving yourself through inebriation or anesthetization, and therefore there's a there's a two pronged approach. Yeah, we've made great headway in uncovering and exposing the monolithic conspiracy, but we still have a lot of homework to do on the positive side to get out of slave think and to get out of hive think. You know, the the the, the uh, ubiquitous um, collectivism that is uh, symptomatic of these leaders, and we are contaminated by it. So it, there's, there's a lot of work still to be done on the spiritual side. I think uh, we could probably look at something like the Borg where they assimilate. And we have to get away from that and think for ourselves and not be tied into group mentality to a certain extent. We have to take back our sovereignty and our freedom. And I think that's what's happening now in Ireland. People are beginning to wake up. 
and seeing what the government are doing is only benefiting the one percent and not the ninety nine percent and that's that's what's happening at the moment, which is good to see and one of the things he said there about the pretense that were in slavery and I remember seeing a photo on Facebook where you had this big big this big horse tied to one of these plastic chairs that didn't weigh much at all but his perception the horse's perception with this this chair was probably a solid object that secured that he couldn't get away from but if he actually seen realized what the chair was in reality was a light piece of plastic that he could pull around the place and so we need to look at you know their perception of the way we see society the way we see the system and if it's not benefiting us, we have more power than what we realise. But we have to find out. We have to look into that and find out about by knowledge, by learning and speaking to other people. And then applying that. And um, civil disobedience, you know, that's really where we have to go. Peaceful civil disobedience. And if everybody did it, which is what's happening now, and the majority of people are, you know, over here in Ireland, especially with the war they made the protesting, then, you know, maybe we have a chance of making that change and never ever have this kind of government in place where... They take advantage of the people. That's right. There's on history, it's a simple fact to prove it, that every time a mafia-like organization grew up, uh, like the one that Prohibition, the classic famous one in the New York, uh, Chicago, you know, and, and a few guys, you know, the Jenna brothers or Al Capone or any of these people, with a very small, relatively small force, were able to completely strong arm and cow huge populations of immigrants get them to do you know, what they wanted, like making the illegal alcohol and whatever. And that one lily-livered individual from these huge immigrant groups could simply get all of the people together, pick up a couple of hammers, and walk around the corner to the you know, headquarters of these gangsters and beat the living shit out of them and, and throw them into the Atlantic Ocean. But, but, if a rival religious group on the other side of town starts slandering you and your group, oh my God. World War Three. Mm. They could get up for that. And Ireland is, of course, the classic example of this. So wait a minute. How, what, what's going on here? You can't raise you, you're, you're shivering in fear uh, when a couple of gangsters come and push you about and not a single record on history of history books of a group getting up and going and taking care of it without having to call on authorities. But if that same ethnic group, just like you have now with Jews and Arab uh, Islamics or any of these other uh, level, you see it all over the world, the moment that somebody you know, raises a finger to them, now it's, it's World War III. That is the thing I'm talking about. So just, so what could, it's great knowledge, it's great news to know that there may be you know, a chink in the armor of the great dragon. But the thing is that that still doesn't really make you free. You have to make yourself free. You've got to disengage uh, you know, psychologically. Uh, and that is a particular, that's a spiritual process now. That's a very interesting process. And, uh, and we're not really used to it. The masses aren't anyway. So it takes a long time for them to get with this gig. So even if the, the higher conspiracy is going through its death throes, uh, the administration is still there, but it's a kind of an empty administration. And you can really, really see this. If you study what's happening in the East economically, if you see what's happening, if you really dig beneath the surface, you can tell that what I'm saying has a lot of credence. But it still doesn't mean that you're going to be psychically free. Now, one thing I missed earlier on, if I could just insert it now, and that is one of the other reasons why, uh, one of the other symptoms of why this bestial, you know, evil archy could be uh, uh, dying off is simply that evil itself, I've said this at work, is itself unsustainable. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, that regardless of the kind of, uh, as I said, gung-ho, you know, uh, obsessive nature of these evil arcs, they're evil, they're mad, they're pathological. And so nature, which is in perfect order, does not support their agenda. And that means that any kind of evil outfit, especially the one of the global level we're talking about, it literally requires such incredible mental and physical resources, it's actually quite staggering. And this is why I say that once upon a time you may have had that kind of control, and you may have had those resources at your fingertips, like in, again, you know, the pre-industrial age or whatever. But as time goes by, you simply don't. There's other little poxy conspiracies that crop up to, to rival you. There's all sorts of uh, internal uh, dynastic rivalries. There's death, in which the main ideologists, who are always few, die off, and then their descendants prove incompetent. We've seen this in business. We've seen this in local politics. And we, we certainly can see it in science. You know, uh, And we see it in all areas of life. Uh, and we certainly can imagine it happening on this higher level. And as I said, these higher forces don't like us. They don't even like our planet. I spoke about this in the Atlantis book. It's a big downer being insane, you see. Yeah. Uh, the inherent order of the universe, the inherent order of our planet, 
And the, the order of the human soul is actually obnoxious to these people. So they're the ones who really got their backs against the wall. Now they compensate for this by a different kind of order, a malignant order, a draconian order. So they're, they're they, you know, one of their symbols is the beehive. Uh, another one of their symbols, as we all know, is the hierarchical pyramid. But never imagine for a moment that that order that they're into is anything natural or organic. It's not. It's a very pathological, uh, uh, draconian order that they impose, and they impose it like a sort of ex exoskeleton of control, because inwardly these people are mush psychologically. You know, they're in deep, deep psychosis and, ne and neurosis. And so the, or and the universe is not, and the human soul is not, it's in a state of order. And therefore that order is obnoxious to these people, and that is another reason one can chart up on the board as to why the old monolithic thing is not working. You know, so what we're doing now is we're in a, we're in a very pliable time. You know, astrologically, uh, don't want to bore people with all the astrological jargon, but you know, Pluto is in the sign of uh, Capricorn. This tells people who know about astrology what I'm talking, backs up what I'm talking about. That amazing upheavals from deep down, deep deep down, you know, uh, can cause seismic reactions uh, that disturb the establishment, the status quo. So there's that. There's certain cosmic things helping us, you know. But again, it all matters that we need to tear up the contract as well. We need to also do our part to sign off from this and then enter into a different relationship with fear. Like you said earlier, they keep us in fear. Yeah, but what is fear and why do you have it and you know all of that. So there's a there's a very interesting psychological component to this. Yeah, well I normally say to people that, you know, if you fear something, the best way to stop fearing it is to learn about it because education yeah. will get you away from the fear. And that's the end of the clip. Wow. Well, it was very interesting. What radio show, what radio show did you say it was? Um... Well, I pulled this off a of YouTube, the YouTube channel. It's um, Open Your Mind Radio. Um, so the it says here that um, it's O Y M Internet Radio. That's the uh, the name of the channel. O Y M. Oh, cool! I've never heard of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the link later. What did you think of it? I thought that that guy was so completely spot on that I felt compelled to have a Google Hangout about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt that he said it in in 20 minutes what would hello what would have taken me like you know 3 hours to explain mm -hmm. because I'm such a long-winded bastard. Yeah, he did a great job. Um I didn't catch all of it, but I loved what he said about how if we want anything to change, we have to realize we have to set ourselves free of, you know. The only reason they have authority over us and that the system works the way it does is because we believe in the system. Or, well, we believe in what we think the system is. You know? Yep. I completely agree with that. Or as um, Larkin Rose said, um, if the problem is the mental malware in your head, then it doesn't matter who you get rid of in office. Yeah, exactly, because you're always conducting yourself according to that. Yeah, and kind of like like a point you had made about you know the slaves back in the 1800s and stuff. There were so many more slaves than plantation owners. They could have all yeah. just been like, fuck this and walk out of there. But they yeah. didn't because they believed in their slavery. Exactly. So slaves that are actually the ones that kept the system of slavery going through their belief in it. And, you know, the same way with the fiat monetary system now that we're enslaved by debt. And, you know, we're, it, we have an addiction to oil, even though for the last hundred years there have been countless other ways to generate power that, you know, don't require oil. And then things like nuclear is nothing more than a very dangerous, expensive um, steam engine. That's all it is. I mean, you could do the same thing with geothermal energy, and it would be safe. Um, I think that one of the biggest components. I mean, everyone says they want freedom. They believe in you know natural rights. But the thing is, I think a big part of you know if we ever want to change the system is we're going to have to basically we're going to have to confront the part of ourselves that likes authority 
that thinks we need it, you know? Yeah. There's By a the part way, of us that likes to be babysat, that likes that. Who was that next to you over there? That was my cousin Jesse. I'm at Emily's house right now. Oh, okay, because I, I didn't know where you were, who you were with, so... I, I was just like, okay, if that's Emily, yeah. she's completely different than the last time I checked. No, that's Jesse. Hey, you okay. want to see some cool new shoes I got? Sure, why not? <laughs> cool, huh? It almost looks like the laces could glow in the dark or something. Yeah, they're mint green. They're real cute. <laughs> they were on sale pretty good, though, so it didn't break the bank. <laughs> So does Jesse know we're streaming live and this is being recorded? Yeah, I told her. Oh, okay. Because it's, oh, it's, it's always a good thing to let people know that instead of like, hey, you're live, say hello. <laughs> you know, it's always always good to warn people. <laughs> yeah, I told her. She okay. wanted to be on camera. Huh? She wanted to be shown on the thing. Oh, okay. Um... Just making sure you weren't, like, surprised butt-sexing people, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> Camera rape, you're live, you know. I would never do that. <laughs> well, she came over and said, she's like, oh, what are you doing? So I'm like, hey, there's Jesse. I showed her. And I said, we're doing a live Google Hangout on YouTube right now. And so was she listening to the recording? No, she just got home. Oh, okay. Um, so was he, I guess I, um, just wanted to ask you a question for clarification. He was basically saying that the elites aren't necessarily conducting themselves the way they do because they're, like, fully psychopathic. It's just because they have their own, um, their own dysfunctional programming. They're becoming increasingly incompetent. Hence the idea of, like, the, the the dysfunctional, neurotic playboy, you know, spending all the family money away until they're broke and, you know, things like that. He was bringing up examples yeah. of common dysfunction. So it's like as new, new generations of the elites continue forward, they're increasingly more narrow-minded and kind of they have this lack of vision of what the original plan was so it's like their own system of dumbing people down is dumbing them down as well like I said before you, you can't be a warden of the prison without being in the prison yourself you know what I mean they think they're exempt from and outside of their own system but they're not they're more trapped than we are it's Huh? Wow. Because, I mean, their programming is influencing them some amount. Yeah, I mean, they, default. they have their own indoctrination, just like everybody else does. They have their own sets of, of belief systems about the way they think things should be or whatever. And, you know... Oh, yeah. The more the more arrogant people get, and the bigger a chip they have on their shoulder, the more their brain kind of <laughs> goes out the window, so to speak, and they're not really thinking yeah. rationally or clearly, and so they're making all sorts of stupid mistakes because they're being so arrogant, like, oh, don't question me, my way is the right way, my way or the highway, and they're just on this egoic high, and they're not really using intelligence to plan anything out. They're not taking other things into consideration. Their predecessors were a lot more intelligent and a lot more careful than the modern day elites are. Wow, so that's, yeah. That's why their whole plan and all their structures are going down the toilet. And we're seeing that by all the dysfunction and, and chaos in the world right now. You know, because... And Oh, people, yeah. People who learn about the plan going back the centuries are looking around and going, wait a minute, none of this seems to be going according to that plan. How does this fit in? And the obvious answer is that it doesn't. Because these younger generations, just in the same way that, you know, sometimes a teenager will utilize technology in such a way to where they start taking life for granted 
instead of using it as a tool to help them, they start taking life for granted. The elites are the same way. They've got all this modernization that the previous generations didn't have. So they're taking things for granted and they're not really fully understanding the original plan or the implications, so they are fucking up left, right, up and down. And they have chips on their shoulder that are so big it's resulting in perpetual incompetence. Damn. That works to our advantage. And like I said, they have their own goals and stuff, things that they're striving towards. Yeah, and, and I part mean, of them thinks that people are so smart for leading humanity. Is they're just idiots. People forget that they're they are human too. They have personal goals and they have thoughts and they have feelings and they have their own views of the world. They're not these infallible godlike super geniuses. They're human. So they, they they each have their own ideas on things. Just like you and me, we agree on some things. We don't agree on everything. Why? Because we're each individual, unique human beings. But the same is true with the with the elites. Only with the elites, they're at each other's throats instead of talking things out. And they're just in a slightly different position than us. Well, not slightly different. They're in a different position, but... Similar, but you know, they have more money to work with. They, they can kill people anytime they want, and it's just it's yeah, kind I of mean, their thing. Yeah, I mean, the people that would throw their own mother under the bus if it suits them, you know. I mean, these, you know, when they when they grow up in an environment where they've got all, all this money, all these resources, all this technology, they start taking everything for granted. And the more they take things for granted, mm -hmm. they kind of get stupider and more narrow-minded, which makes them more prone to being negligent and making more and more mistakes. And the more negligent they become and the more they fuck up, it puts them at an ever-increasing disadvantage. So then it doesn't matter how much money they have or how much resources they have or whatever it is that they have, if they're not wielding their tools intelligently and wisely, then it doesn't matter that they even have the tools. Very true. Yeah, um... And, like I... If you do something with a certain mindset behind it, it doesn't matter, you know, like you said, what you're using. If you're using the tool to stab yourself in the leg, it's just... That's not going to be a positive thing, no matter what way you try and spin it. Or no matter who you are. So... Or think of it like... Yeah, and I mean, this is good news for... Gravity doesn't care mm -hmm. if you're rich or poor, or if you're a president or a homeless person. Gravity's going to take you right off the cliff no matter what. <laughs> yep. And these people, they're kind of like us in the sense that sometimes it's a little convenient to think that we're exempt from the laws of physics, but we aren't, you know? Yeah, we, we think that, we kind of separate the idea of, you know, human social activity from from actual physics, we think. Physics applies to, like, fire and rocks and plastic and inanimate things or planets zipping around the sun or whatever. We're not thinking that it actually applies to how we conduct ourselves in our own lives and that we are made up of this energy and this matter that is governed by these laws of physics. So that means even our social interactions are still governed by those physics, and we take this completely for granted. And we, look at, we look at that mm -hmm. idea of, oh, well, that's just ideological, or, you know, that, that that's that's whatever. That's not physical, so it can't, it can't have a physical implication. Well, ideas may be non-physical, but they do have physical implications. If someone didn't dream up they the have idea energy. of it, yeah, if someone didn't dream up the idea of a jet plane, then we'd have never invented it. 
And a jet plane is a very physical thing. We didn't stumble right. upon jet plane trees growing somewhere one day and just picking the jet planes off the trees. You know, non-physical human imagination needed to conceive of these types of ideas and then bring them into the physical. If a human never did that, there wouldn't be jet planes. The human brought the non-physical into the physical by using imagination and leading that into the process of invention. And that's why our thoughts play such a huge role in the world we live in and the realities we have. You know? Yep. We conduct ourselves based upon our thoughts and our internal state and how we feel. Yeah. And that all is energy. I mean, it wouldn't even... if Everything in the universe is energy, so it wouldn't even be able to exist if it wasn't energy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I can back up the idea that our belief systems take precedence over any quote-unquote facts or evidence as far as determining our reality, and I can easily prove that without getting new agey woo-woo or airy-fairy. Really simple. Human ego is always going to take physical action in alignment with whatever it is we believe regardless of whether or not that belief is in something factual or whether our belief is a total piece of shit. We're still going to act in the direction of that belief. And if that belief is a total neurotic piece of shit and we take action in the direction of that, there's going to be consequences for that. We're going to be a little bit neurotic. And that's what's happening with the elites. You know, they have their own, like you said, they have their own meme and their own behavioral patterns that they've, that they, and their own culture, that they do. Fucking up left and right. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a different reflection of very similar ideas. They conduct themselves based off of their egos. Yeah. It's all justification. Just we'll like get, we'll get it this way. They design the educational system, so we're taught to think like them. Oh yeah, just in a more um, disempowered way, as opposed to. Well, it's the, the it's the other side of the coin, so yeah. to speak. you know it's it's the same coin, just you know heads and tails. They feel that they they should be the one to to rule over everybody, and we feel that we need babysitters to to rule over us. But it's still one coin. Because when someone has a victim mentality, they oh, yeah. feel very self-righteous and powerful. They're like, I'm right. That gives me power. I'm right about my victimization. You're going to give me sympathy because I am right. My victimization is the only correct reality, and I am right. And people feel very, very justified and very powerful when they're sh when they shake their fists and say, "I'm the victim. I'm right. You're not going to tell me I'm wrong. Fuck you. I'm standing my ground." They feel very self-righteous and powerful. So people feel very powerful being the victim, and it's neurotic. So that's the side mm -hmm. of the coin we're on. On the other side of the coin, they don't play the role of the victim. They play the role of the perpetrator. But it's all the yeah. same thing. Because in a sense, they, they feel like a victim in the sense that if I don't perpetrate on people, then they can victimize me. Yeah. So to prevent it's becoming a victim, I'm going to make a first strike. I'm this. Huh? You know, yeah. It's, like you said, because there's a chance of, you know, humanity running itself into whatever they think is going to happen if there's no authority. They think, it's my duty. I have to do this. Otherwise, there will be no order and my life will be just yeah. complete chaos. Yeah, they think that if they don't do it, then, you know, it's it's like they're keeping back a big fucking wall of catastrophe and, and trying to keep catastrophe yeah. away from them. So, you know, like that guy said, you know, they, they despise us. They see us as a threat. They see us as a problem just waiting to happen. So they need to keep control so that we don't infringe upon them. So they're, they're feeling victimized in the sense that 
you know, if they don't act as the perpetrator, then, you know, human the rest of humanity is going to come and infringe on them and make them a victim and make them feel powerless. Yep. So they have to disempower everybody else first. And, you know, that's uh, that's their yeah. their mentality about it. And it's all, it's all fear-driven. And because fear yes. is they know... They uh, because they know that fear can be used as a weapon against them. They use it as a weapon against us. They they know very well right, how because fear. Have, it's either us or them. You know, we're the select few that get to. You know, be aware of our power. You know, we're the ones in charge, and it if everyone's in charge, it wouldn't be you know safe basically. Well, it's it's more like if people were educated on how to be sovereign individuals, then there would really be people. People wouldn't have a need to dominate other people yeah. if, if they understood that yes, we're all connected as a collective, but simultaneous to our individuality. We're all unique individuals but we're all also linked. We're on the same planet. We all yeah. interact. Unless you're a hermit living in a cave forever, chances are you're going to interact with other humans. So it's that idea that both are true. Instead of having individuality against collectivism and these two ideas fighting each other, instead to realize that both are, you know, both exist in parallel and they don't need to fight. Yes, you're a part yes. of the collective, and yes, you're also an individual, and both are equally important. Exactly. And, and that's, called that's, being the, a grown um, that's called being a grown-up. That's what society does not teach us how to do. Because we, we're collective in the sense that, just in the sense that we're all human, and we all live on Earth. Like, I'm not even trying to be, you know... Like, you're not trying to be ideological. Yeah, well, it's just... You're being literal. You're, you're a part of a community. That can't be helped. There's other humans that, around. It just, that's the way it is. But you're also your own individual expression of what it's like to be a human, and that's okay, too. And you're allowed, and you're an individual in the form of your perspective, because you're an individual consciousness projected into an individual experience. Yeah, but, well, simultaneously, there's other people. Everyone else having their experience. Both exist and both are valid and the world would be boring if that wasn't the case. So basically, that is so true. Um, the idea of collectivism versus the individual, that is really, I mean, it's just another war that we try and put on polarities. It's neurotic and stupid. It's like saying that, that the right kidney and the left kidney have to go to war with each other. You know, it's, it's, it's that ridiculous. Just like... Um, the positive and negative feelings we have, they can't, you know, we only want to be perfectly present, 100% present with ourselves if we're having a positive emotion, because we think that when we're happy, we want to be happy because that's the only time that we can feel whole, because that's the only time that we're willing to be with ourselves fully, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and because we're, we're judging our negative emotions as quote-unquote bad. Yeah, we judge them as bad so we won't we don't allow ourselves to, you know, we put resistance on them, we don't allow ourselves to feel them fully, and then... And then they co-opt us instead of allowing ourselves to, to face it and release it. It's yeah. like building up inside of us like we're a container and air is continuing to go into the container with no outlet, and eventually there's this big boom! Yeah, and I mean, we wonder why we've, you know, we don't feel whole and what's missing. The thing that's missing is because... We aren't, the only time we're fully present with ourselves is when we're happy, and that's what we really like about the feeling of happiness. It's not that happiness is better than feeling bad, it's that that's the only time we allow ourselves to be there, to really sit with ourselves, because everything other than that is too uncomfortable. I was going you know? to say earlier that what the what the globalists do is kind of kind of similar to, um, to what a lot of chicks do, like the idea of the girl wants friends, Feel but... But, but still, they, they push people away because they're afraid that that if a person gets to know them, that, you know, they're going to get taken advantage of or hurt in some way. Right. So 
they push everybody away preemptively just on the assumption that everybody's kind of out to get them. And they base that assumption on other past experiences, which might not have been so great, but they're not understanding that it's not their fault that they were born into the society that they were uh, they were born into. They were just taught a particular view, and they've yeah. been around people who were taught that same view. And that if you shift your view, you are no longer compatible with those people, and then you start to attract people who match that same sort of view. So it's not that, that these better views don't exist and that there's no one out there that has it. It's just you, it, when you're locked into one thing, you know, the idea of there being being something else just seems yeah. ridiculous because you point to all your past experience and go, nope, this is all I've ever seen, so that's all there ever must be. Mm -hmm. And that's more than just a little arrogant, but that's how we're taught to act. Well, it's because that the idea that there might be other possibilities of how things could be, it rages against our feeling that, you know, we can, like you said, we can really feel justified when we think, you know, things only go bad for me, there can't be anything else. Because that's a, that's comfortable, you know. Rich get richer, told, poor get poor. If I life is hard. If I didn't, if I didn't have any bad better. luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, law, yeah, there's nothing go luck. wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> Yeah. But those um, are all belief systems. They are. And I'm not, I'm not saying... Hello. And I'm not saying that those systems of belief aren't true. I'm just saying they're not absolutely true. They're not the only game. Right. They're, exactly. not the, they're not the only option. And when we realize that they're only true because we're choosing to place, you know, value in them, that's when we can take back the power and... I mean, hell, look at... Uh, look at coordinate... Uh, ourselves late. The signal's kind of breaking up there a tiny bit. Um, we, we have to go soon anyways, but this oh, okay. has been excellent. You should continue talking um, like about, I figured you probably had more to say, so you should keep the hangout going when I leave. Yeah. Well, I was just, I was just this gonna has say, been good discussion. I was just going to say, look at, look at little kids. Like a little tiny bit. Look at little kids. Little kids. Try, try telling a try telling a little kid that they don't have the right to feel sad, and they'll look at you like you're smoking something you shouldn't be. They don't understand the right like you're of, of negative emotions being bad. They feel completely justified about feeling whatever emotion they feel in that moment. They do. Yes, because they you're do. Allowed. Dave Kelso, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a good point, Dave Kelso. That is a good point. And you good point. You realize and isn't it just a little bit of a bad? Live on the net, right? You've been informed. So you're I like, you're like live to the world. Good. That's a good thing. You're, you have a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna About the kids. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but before that's the, how people are as adults, too. But before the kids grow up and turn, and, and turn into us, because adulthood is like a, a, a state of extended adolescence because we're just taught increasingly more neurotic bullshit and just get like more and more immature. Yeah, and I mean, not to mention that most of the time people are waging a war against parts of themselves. Yeah. So I mean, that, I mean that's, what, that's what clinical depression is, feeling sad about feeling sad, angry about feeling angry, you know, not giving ourselves the right to feel the negative emotion. So it's almost like a, a, a microphone and a speaker oscillating back into each other over and over again until it just turns into this wah, 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 annoying, loud, you know. So clinical depression is like the emotion. And it's all you can think about. It. That's how you feel, whatever. Yeah, that emotional oscillation that just keeps building and building and building and keeps getting more painful. Yeah, and the only way that we really ever feel whole is by integrating, you know, being with ourselves present fully if, no matter what is happening. What if we you give yourself permission to feel how you feel, then it's kind of like muting the microphone for a second. Sure. And then the oscillation stops. I'm going to talk to him about this. Okay. Um, Emily wants to add you on Facebook. 
Okay, she can feel free to do so. I want to discuss this with you. He's very insightful. Well, feel free to subscribe to this channel on YouTube as well. Okay. Have a good one, Dave. Catch you later, then. Bye. Love you, dude. Bye. Me too. Catch you later. Alrighty. Well, Kristen had to go. And General Tate isn't on right now. Let's see if there's anybody else who might want to participate or if I should maybe close this down or what because I'm really out of things to say about this topic, believe it or not. I don't see anybody else on, so... Yeah, I guess I could close this down, but... Um, I hope everybody who watches this has found it to be insightful and um, maybe it gives you something to think about. And as for um, Open Your Mind Radio, um, I'm trying to get like the channel information here. Um, it looks like they haven't customized their their channel link. Um, it's OYM Internet Radio is like the name. Or oh no, wait, they have customized it. Okay, YouTube's just being silly <coughs> and was not showing it to me at first. Um, so yeah, it's just OYM Internet Radio. So you know, YouTube.com forward slash OYM Internet Radio and that is where I borrowed the little clip from. The title of the video in question is Open Your Mind, OYM, Michael um, Ser Serian, um, T-S-A-R-I-O-N, um, and that's a radio show episode. It says November 23rd, 2014. But it's listed as no November 24th, 2014, because I guess that's when the video got done, you know, processing or whatever the case uh, may be. So it says, guest, um, Michael Sarian, author, lecturer, uh, researcher, um, so on and so forth. It's got um, a list of things that he talks about and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and this, that particular video has 146 likes and over 18,000 views and, you know, so on and so forth. I've only gotten, like, actually halfway through that video. It's almost two hours because it's, like, a radio show episode that's been uploaded to YouTube. But um, it's it's been pretty cool so far, and I've been, been listening to some of uh, Michael's other stuff lately, and it's pretty insightful. I don't agree with, like absolutely everything the man says, but he's pretty spot on with a lot of shit, so it's pretty cool. So, thank you for watching. Um, check out the rest of the stuff on our channel. You know, like, fave, subscribe, whatever, share on social media, blah, blah. Alright, so thanks for watching. Peace out, and catch you later.